Hello everyone, it's me, the Boss Hog, and we're back for another video. After a few weeks away, mainly caused by just extreme busyness at work. However, we've got lots to update on, some big dividends starting to arrive for the UK dividend season. We've got a new position in the Dutch ETF I'm really excited about. I also sold out of one of my previously spoken about high convictions, which we'll get to as well. And as I also want to talk about some of my larger positions and their earnings, um, which I would say have been pretty respectable. And I just want to explain why and my thoughts moving forward on them. Let's do it. So in terms of portfolio to start with, uh, the last update I did was actually for the week ending the 7th of April. So it's been quite a while. Broadly speaking, things have been moving in the positive direction. You can see here my PL has basically trebled during that time, but it has been pretty rocky to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I have been adding some cash during that time and making some moves. And instead of sort of walking through my portfolio breakdown, I actually thought what I'd do is just show you my transactions over the last few weeks and it would be easier to start from that point. So here they are basically. This is um, normally I wouldn't show this in my portfolio, but basically I've just extracted it from a transactions tab that sort of feeds into my summaries uh, that I do show on this video. And then I've just organized them by sections. So first of all, we're up to uh, four and a half thousand so far for our um for our deposits to date. The aim as a reminder is to get to 40,000 for my ISA across the year. Broadly speaking, running about on track. Uh, technically at the moment, I'd be a week behind, but also I get paid on the 20th of the month. So there'll be a sort of catch up and that's typically the rhythm that I work to. So broadly speaking, happy with the start of the year for deposits. Got ahead of myself in April and then have gradually been pulled back over May to date. Dividends are going pretty well, to be honest. I got one from MPW that was quite sizable. We're going to look into detail in MPW in a few minutes, so I don't want to spend too much time here. But from my perspective, I remain confident that this represents a good opportunity to average down. And that's what I've been doing, basically, with reinvesting my dividend. Red Row, likewise, this is a UK house builder, so more than happy to be buying these as well. Only very slightly down on these, actually. And I think um, there's already there's so much negatives already in uh, UK house building that it just looks cheap, basically. So even though I don't think many of the house builders are particularly incredible businesses you're looking at like peas between sort of five and nine uh, and they just look like really good value to me i, I like red road specifically just because it's a um a sort of not quite a turnaround play but they've been pivoting away from london and the southeast but build very large fairly expensive forever homes in the suburbs and so i think they're less impacted by the last few years and sort of rising cost of living than other house builders effectively Micron here, if I'm honest with you, I, um, I'm i not quite sure my feelings on this at the moment. I think actually the share price is quite expensive at the moment. It's almost like people are expecting Micron and maybe some of the other semiconductors to come good in the second part of the year. And therefore, you know, they're already bidding up Micron. I actually considered selling Micron when I turned green a few weeks ago, kept on to it and now I'm slightly red, but not by a ton. And broadly speaking, I do think that we're at least six months ahead of where we should be in terms of share price and the actual fundamentals of the business. Phoenix here is a UK life insurance and wealth management business. Um, this is one of my larger dividend positions. You can see here, I, I basically get this dividend twice a year. So £260 is fantastic. And here I'm actually down about 7% before I use this as an opportunity to average down and just basically reinvested the full position. So that felt great. And ASML here, I have a mid-sized position in ASML actually, but I'm up sort of 25% on it. So I decided to put this into an ETF, um, for my bank's ETF. Um, so that, those are my dividends that I've received, basically a couple of big ones. And also Phoenix is really my first um, UK position. So in the, in the UK, you typically have two dividends a year instead of four. And you typically get your first one in sort of May and your last one in either September or October. So this sort of middle part of the year for me is actually my highest income bit because not only do I get my regular quarterly dividend payments from my US stocks, but I get my twice a year ones from my uh, UK ones as well. So Phoenix was the first of several large ones that I'm expecting over the next couple of months, basically. So that felt really good as well. I did do a little bit of selling. <clears throat> I'm going to start with my ETF in Canada, which I almost sold down entirely. I, I sold this actually super well. It's fallen back just a little bit, um, not for a huge profit, like 4%. But considering this is, you know, very heavy on the financials, I consider that an absolute win. Um, it's a very defensive, safe kind of ETF that does pay a dividend. And I just basically was taking some money and putting it into sort of other dividends, uh, using it as a chance to sort of take some profit and average down elsewhere. I do plan to continue buying in Canada. It's one of three now. 
uh, geographically distinct ETFs that I have alongside um, India and the Netherlands, which we'll get to in just a second. But yeah, I still remain broadly confident on Canada and I don't have a bunch of exposure to Canada elsewhere. So I will be buying back into it, um, but decided to take some profits and buy it elsewhere. This one I want to call out because I've done a couple of videos on Fever Tree and I still love the brand and the product. But basically there was a rumor a, a few weeks ago now that they were sort of, that, that they'd either received the bill approach or put themselves up for offer or were doing a strategic um, review with Morgan Stanley, a lot of which has since been rebuffed, but the share price had run up a lot. And in my opinion, you know, it's now trading on like a 60 PE, something like that. And I just, I think like the fundamentals just aren't reflective of where the share price is. So I was actually able to sell this for a, a reasonable profit considering how red I had been and decided really, yeah, to exit the position because I think this is like at least 18 months ahead of where it should be even assuming relatively good success sort of converting what I think are good plans into operational performance, which is rare fever tree have really fallen short over the last couple of years. You know, did expand at the wrong time and um, did get like battered and continue to be battered with both shipping freight costs, storage costs and glass costs as well. And yeah, even though it's a profitable business, I don't think it's going to go anywhere and I really hope it succeeds. For me, it was just an excellent opportunity for me to sell at a, a again, a, a reasonable profit. Um, so yeah, I was, I was ha actually very happy to sell this and exit my position of Fever Tree entirely. And here with uh, Allianz Technology Trust, I decided here just to take a small amount of profit. Again, I'm quite green on this at the moment, about 10%. Not bad considering the market at the moment. And uh, I, I still have like 2,700 shares. So basically here I was sold about 10% of my position. And this was really to open up uh, a new position in the Dutch uh, ETF, which we'll get to in just a second. You can see though that I sold this at £2.29 and I'd actually been buying at sort of 2 20 and just averaging up. Um, you know, you look at the NAV for this uh, ETF, so it's a net asset value and it's at 2 50 So for me, even though I'm sort of in the 2 10s at the moment, 2 12 I think to be exact, for my average buy, I'm still sort of looking to be adding um, to, to this ETF position in my portfolio anytime I get an opportunity to. So we'll see how that goes. This one here though, I just want to thank uh, Discord for pulling, for pointing this one out for me. Um, it's got a couple of holdings I really like. So this is the Amsterdam Exchange, I think is what AEX stands for. Um, and yeah, it's just a very solid ETF really. It's slightly outperformed the 8% over its sort of lifespan, not by a ton, but again, broad-based ETFs really uh, sort of are on fire. Um, it's got also got a couple of positions that I really like. Um, sort of Adyen would be one of those positions. Um, it's sort of quite high up there. It's also fairly heavy on areas that where I'm weak. So for example, consumer staples and energy account for over 40% of its uh, holdings. I have basically zero in both of those sectors. So for me, it's a very complementary ETF where and where it's not complementary, like where I have overlaps with things like ASML, with um, with Adgen, which are kind of exists in other ETFs that I have, and indeed for ASML, I have a specific holding in it. Um, I'm actually very happy to have that overlap because I think the companies are so great. So it's just it just seemed like a very well-rounded ETF that, in particular, fitted into my portfolio very well. So this is both new positions. I bought them on the same day, but for whatever reason, my brokerage broke them into two. And I'm very much looking forward to building a position in the Netherlands uh, specifically. Uh, I just, I, I'm very bullish on the Netherlands in general anyway, um, compared to a lot of uh, Central European countries. And I just, you know, I've worked with Dutch people a lot and uh, I, I kind of like what I'm seeing and I'm really confident in it. So that was my decision there. Outside of that, I've pretty much been taking a fairly broad approach to sort of buying ETFs at the moment. So for anyone who's not aware, because my wife works in private equity, it's almost impossible for me to buy individual holdings currently. I uh, just have restrictions uh, that are quite significant. And so I'm mostly buying ETFs with the exception of when I can do dividend reinvestment. That's the one exception that I have so I can buy individual shares at that moment in time. Um, but yeah, I have to report this basically every quarter to her employer. So it's not the easiest situation to be in, but it is what it is. So my approach to ETFs is kind of to fill in gaps in my portfolio to sort of build for the future and you know to sort of um supplement my own ignorance basically so for things like automation i've got sort of a digital security one here again i flirted with getting involved in these kind of specific holdings before but it's just never really worked out very well so i'm just going to accept the fact that i just don't know these areas particularly well uh, but i still want exposure to them right same with clean energy 
Uh, this global infrastructure one here is one of my newer positions. This is meant to be a defensive holding, so I'm just going to add to it very gradually and just kind of use it as a, a, a bit of a hedge uh, within my portfolio. I have been buying quite heavily here the, the small caps. Um, it's been a big focus for me over the last few months to basically be buying growth companies, technology companies and financials just because I think they're beaten up and you know I'm still 20 years away from retiring. So this is for me a great buying opportunity and I think this ETF is um, undervalued. So I'm keen on adding to it whilst I can basically. Another example that I haven't been buying a ton of recently is I sort of don't want to be get stuck with a huge position in a very red situation. That's a mistake I've read, made in the past is the banks ETF. Now, this is sort of about 60 40 now between small caps and um, US majors. Um, and here I just put the ASML dividend into it, basically. But I do have about uh, two and a half percent of my portfolio in there. And I think now it has fallen far enough that I think it justifies maybe averaging it a little bit more. Uh, my average, though, is still about 428, I think. So I'm still pretty red on this. Um, but again, I do plan on adding to my financial position uh, in this ETF. So we'll see. Then I've got my emerging market ETS, a relatively new position also, but I'm just averaging into that nice and slowly. Similar with India as well. This is actually my second turn in India. Um, I was in India a couple of years ago as in the ETF here and have come back since. There are a few options available in terms of Indian ETFs, but I, I decided to go with this one. Here, this, this is just dividend reinvestment, basically, that you're seeing there. SMT, so this is my sort of, again, growth and actually private tech companies as well. It's cool to have that exposure. Pretty beaten up at the moment, but again, we are following it down. And here I'm still sort of uh, minus about 12% or so. So I know a few people are extremely red on this, but I, I'm sort of um, very optimistic on this. I now actually subscribe to their newsletter. So twice a year, I get a very nice magazine come through that actually explains it to me. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, if there's any sort of interest in a deep dive into SMT, let me know. The one negative I have with SMT is I'm not really convinced yet on their largest holding, which is Moderna. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll see, but outside of Moderna, I have I really like a lot of their um, positions. ASML is high, Adyen is high, Northvolt as well is pretty cool, which is a private company that's uh, doing batteries in Europe, so that's a, a nice one for me. Then there's a bunch of sort of Chinese tech as well that again I would not really have access to. Um, several things are private within that as well. About thirty percent of the ETF is private, which scares a lot of people, by the way. And you do have to accept a lot of um, volatility as a result of that. But to me, I've now read up on, you know, how they value their private holdings. And for me, I'm more than happy to, to continue to have it, basically. So that's what we do. Um, my consumer staples here, again, I'm rebuilding this position, having taken a very small amount of profit beforehand. It is a defensive hedge for me, and it's just sort of a, something that I need to get exposure to in my portfolio. Um, it does have a few holdings I really like, including Costco is the main one in there. But it has a bunch of stuff I don't really love as well. But again, here, and I also, by the way, I consider it very expensive uh, for an ETF, considering it's meant to be defensive stocks um, that are fairly unexciting on the whole. So we'll see. Um, mining, likewise, a little bit red on this at the moment, although I, I moved this between my wife and my ISA, so I took a bunch of profit previously. So overall, I'm about flat, although my unrealized position is sort of minus 5%. Again, this hasn't been helped with sort of worries about China, but I, I'm a long-term fan i guess of mining i don't think it's going anywhere and so i want big exposure real estate very similar here down a little bit but not too much and we are flat on what i would class as our big healthcare big pharma that kind of stuff so this is uh, an etf there as well from that perspective so lots of buys from my sort of near five grand uh, then i've been doing a bit of selling and some dividend as well so that's a walkthrough of all the transactions i've had since my last video hopefully that's interesting uh, if i go back then to my dashboard and just start at the top so uh, you'll see, by the way, week on week here, because I'm doing this video on Sunday, some of the FX movements already started to happen because part of the world is obviously uh, on Monday already. And so this is the reason for the minus 60 here. This is basically a pure currency uh, transaction item. Minus four weeks gives an interesting overview as to, to where we are. So again, my last video was technically five weeks ago, so this won't line up perfectly, but almost. Um, so here, you know, our dividends now have started to come through, which is awesome. And uh, hopefully this will increase as well as we go through the year. I'm going to be very curious when we get to our 52 weeks to see what our dividend looks like. But I'm expecting our dividends to be about three grand uh, across the whole year. And again, we should start to see that sort of uptick a little bit um, as we enter into the UK dividend season as well. A little bit of recovery in terms of my benchmarks, still, um, you know, falling behind the S&P and the FTSE 350, which I did briefly overtake in January. Um, 
I'm trying to sort of keep calm about this graph. It is kind of my most important graph and sort of how I measure my own individual performance. So I was feeling really positive about how I rebounded after, you know, uh, last year and started to run ahead. But then I'm also sort of reminding myself that, again, I'm buying for the long term future. I'm really convinced that big tech especially is massively undervalued at the moment. And I think financials as well. Um, very similar like when you actually look at the results that are coming out of u.s banks most of them are really solid you know this should be a really fertile environment for bank stocks you've got like very high interest rate margins you've got very low defaults you've got sort of a very good environment with which to operate in as a bank um, so i think really as soon as the u.s basically um, underwrites um, small banks as well as large ones I think we'll see a, a big bounce back. So again, from my perspective, I continue to buy there. So I'm sort of trying to keep calm from that perspective and remind myself that, you know, this is meant to be a, a long game and I'm still not doing terribly by, by any measure, basically. But I do wish I was especially ahead of the S&P just because I have a fairly tech heavy portfolio. Um, so yeah, so we'll see anyway. Overall, our trading 212 value. So my brokerage, just a smidge under 130 and the same my Google Docs as well, which are pretty closely aligned at the moment, which is what we're obviously expecting to see. Um, likewise here we can see some um, this as well an important graph so we are now back into profit but not by a ton unfortunately so uh, outside of that it looks like Google here is having a slightly funny meltdown so uh, lots of errors here as it tries to find references uh, Google sometimes does this it's really frustrating but it is what it is we've already spoken through most of the um, most of the holdings so not too bad anyway um, outside of that I just will just scroll down very slightly just for anyone who's again newish so here now, if I look at my portfolio on the left bar graph, well, sorry, pie chart here, uh, we're now at the 30% of my portfolio as an ETF. So actually that shot up quite quickly now that I can no longer buy individual shares. But when I take the, the largest sector in each ETF and break it down fully, you can see here, you know, my technology is at 41% and then uh, everything else that we see here as well. So it's still a very tech heavy portfolio. Um, Honestly, I mean, because I still believe that a lot of tech is undervalued, um, I can still see me buying tech. Um, we'll see, though. I think I'm going to put in place like a hard cap of 50%. That should give me lots of breathing room and I can always potentially move some stuff around. But I'd rather not be selling tech when I believe in it in the long term. So some of those sort of targets also feel strangely arbitrary. Um, but yeah, that's how it's currently looking at the moment. And then just to wrap up the portfolio overview, we this week, I guess, with the Phoenix Dividend, um, past our £6,000 dividend received accumulative. So since we started at late November 20 over here. So that feels really good as well. And hopefully this will continue to, to move up um, in the years to come. So uh, I'm always very excited just to pass a new four digit number. I don't quite think this year I'm going to get to 10,000, but next year I do expect to get to 10,000. And again, from my perspective, dividend investing is just a nice way of sort of supplementing stuff, especially when the market sucks or your portfolio sucks, uh, because, you know, it's like a, a nice extra bit of money that feels free. I know it's not, uh, but it kind of can be uh, beneficial when you're uh, being beaten up a little bit. So that's a walkthrough of my portfolio as it stands. We're going to look at some earnings next. Um, it's been a while since I did this and we will go from there. Okay, so in terms of MPW, I think I'm going to start there first. Now, I went on their earnings call, and to be honest with you, it was better than I was expecting. I'm going to start with some interesting, noteworthy transactions and then sort of go into a bit more detail. But first of all, there's quite a significant move from uh, the Australian company HealthScope, specifically that they are exercising an option whereby MPW will be selling them back uh, three hospitals at a cost of 1.2 billion, so that's income to MPW expected. This will reduce MPW's revenue, so their income from rent by 79 million a year. So broadly speaking, I was fine with this transaction. It just is what it is. Similarly as well, there's another um, Prime Healthcare are exercising their option likewise to purchase back three hospitals for 100 million. Similar, that will reduce rents as a result, obviously, because MPW no longer be owning the hospitals that they're renting. They'll go back to the actual healthcare company directly. So you'll likewise be seeing an $11 million uh, reduction as a result of that moving forward. Most of their growth was focusing on organic, um, but they did make a couple of acquisitions. Um, although these aren't new businesses, they're sort of adding hospitals to existing partnerships that they already have. So there was a couple of big ones in Europe, so 44 million uh, in the UK, and that's with Priory for anyone who's UK based, and then 70 million in Germany as well. 
Um, again, that's technically going to be in Q2, whereas this was looking at Q1, but it will be in the same half. Uh, but yeah, most of the focus at the moment from an MPW perspective is on focusing on growth. The, the dividend was declared and unchanged. There had been some concern, and honestly, I think it's massively overdone, um, that MPW wouldn't be able to service their dividend and it might get uh, removed or pulled back or reduced. Um, no obvious sign of that. And, um, you know, MPW feels relatively comfortable with their current position. So um, funds from operations was uh, 0.37 against 0.47 against the year before. They were showing that as basically some negatives, which we'll get to in just a second. However, they, they reaffirmed their full year minimum range at 150. Beforehand, they'd been advising 150 to 165. They basically now made this 150 to 161. So they basically narrowed the range and trimmed off the more optimistic end of that range. But considering, you know, this is a share price that's trading on less than $8, um, you're still effectively looking at like a 5 PE here, even at worst case. And this worst case assumes no income from um, one of the two distressed businesses, basically, that um, MPW are working with. So I would view that as relatively good and relatively conservative. I would also view this as good as well. I've spoken about this before in sort of general updated um, portfolio videos, but Common Spirit are purchasing Stewards operations in Utah. Now, U uh, Steward at their largest were almost 30% of MPW's uh, income. That's expected to drop to 20% after Common Spirit buy these hospitals. Common Spirit is now a new customer, basically, to MPW, and it's a much better business than Steward, like, you know, better um, credit worthiness. Um, by all accounts, it's just it should be better. It introduces a new customer that they can potentially expand the relationship with, and it reduces their exposure to Steward. I suppose I would say that the uh, I feel like here Common Spirit got a relatively good deal on their acquisition, to be honest with you. Um, so there was some sort of bearish argument that MPW were sort of having to take a fairly large haircut. I would say that MPW did take a modest reduction, but you're talking like mid single digits here. And I think, you know, most people in a business situation would accept, you know, getting rid of 6% of their overall income for a much safer business, even though it does reduce your income very slightly, right? Better to take 95% of what feels very comfortably certain, it's certain, against, you know, having 100% of something which is regularly cited as a bear case right so for me I, I would consider this move good i've spoken about it before but just to reiterate and mpw themselves expected to complete in q2 by the end of may specifically uh prospect is one of the two that are rumored no not even rumored accepted to be distressed and um, there was news literally this week and it kind of caused mpw share price to crash by sort of 10 percent across a couple of days that both prospect and steward are financially distressed Again, uh, from a steward perspective, for the last six months, that kind of argument got put to bed because they worked with some investment banks, restructured stuff. And even though steward is private and doesn't disclose anything, the fact that investment banks were willing to you know, do this stuff basically gave a lot of confidence, I would say, to the market that steward wasn't about to hit the wall. But now they're having to go through that same process again because it's sort of a 12 month commitment. So the, the rumors are there, basically. I haven't got anything more concrete on steward other than to say that, you know, it, it is fairly battered as a business. But so far, when you look at sort of the, the coverage that MPW provide as part of their supplementary notes, um, yeah, the, the rent cover is um, sufficient for steward, basically. Their hospitals range between 1.5 and 2.3 x rent to mpw so mpw feel fairly relaxed about steward prospects are a lot different though basically and again from um, mpw's perspective they're not expecting any loan repayments or any rent from prospect this year so uh, and on top of that prospect received a 50 million dollar convertible loan from mpw again bears do regularly point out mpw's incestuous relationship with their uh, customers from MPW's perspective, they are confident that they know the business well and that they feel like they got good terms as part of this agreement. And basically, if there's any problems, they get equity positions uh, as a result. So and I think they said it was like an 11 percent interest rate specifically on this as well. So relatively good terms um, secured. Obviously, if they don't pay it back, it gets a bit messy. But likewise, there's collateral there in order to secure that as well. So MPW, although they couldn't comment on details, um, or didn't want, to, couldn't, they said, they, they cited sort of um, legal privilege um, and confidentiality. They said they were very satisfied to use their wording uh, with the agreements that are in place. So we will see. Um, 
And likewise, as well, it's worth adding the prospect themselves remains, whilst it remains distressed, uh, they also have third party um, binding agreements in place with, yeah, not MPW, but other providers. Um, and again, MPW couldn't discuss that, but were very comfortable with the situation that that they'd managed to work through, even though, like I say, the the, um, the funds from operations this year are expecting no repayment of any kind from prospects. So you can basically wipe out my month's worth of uh, rent or repayments, but that's already been factored in to be clear on the guidance for the year. Uh, there we go. Oh, and sorry, September. So Q4, they're optimistic that they'll start to receive some. But again, the the, um, the state where prospects are most distressed is next year. Uh, it was also very interesting as well. So MPW have decided to strike back against Viceroy Research. So this is kind of a relatively well-known short seller. They are taking to court, basically, claiming that Viceroy can't hide behind statements of opinion and that obviously their research notes are intended to be more than opinion and that they fundamentally disagree with them, they're wrong. Uh, and actually Viceroy's you know, founder is one of the scummiest people you can imagine. And by the way, I'm really not, that's more or less what it says. I, I had a skim through the, um, uh, through the legal case and you know, like the guy is, is British and you know, has um, and got kicked out of his profession for very dubious things, which uh, MPW decided to highlight to, I guess, point out the person's dishonesty and long-term reputation for, um, bending the truth uh, and those kind of things. So very interesting. Viceroy, like I say, struck back with a fairly generic, you know, statements of opinion and it has no claim and they're trying to get it dismissed. But so far it's a, um, an open um, legal case and I will be following up with some interest um, and we'll see how it goes basically. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think this is worth pointing out because, again, the new bearish argument that I've heard is that as MPW needs to start refinancing debts, um, that basically they'll have less and less favourable conditions for debt and will run out of money effectively and their business won't hold up to that shock. This is a fairly common bear, uh, argument at the moment against REITs, right? You've got a combination of very high interest rates, very heavily indebted businesses, as most REITs are by nature of their business. And that ultimately that's going to cause problems for all but the strongest uh, REITs. Um, MPW are keen to point out that, you know, they, they've got enough cash as is today to cover all their debt obligations for the next two years. And that, yes, although they have some of their debt maturing over the next few years, and in fact, about 2031, they have a number of sort of fairly chunky uh, percentages coming due. Um, that, you know, even if they have to pay more, a lot of their um, tenancy agreements have inflation linked caveats and increases in, and basically they're not expecting to run in any problems. So take that for what you will. It's uh, what management was saying. Um, they were asked, and they have been asked several times now, actually, whether they plan to do a buyback, especially apparently because they've got all of this cash available to cover obligations. And actually, especially currently, I agree with MPW's position. In the past, when the shares were like $11, I was making similar arguments that, you know, like if you took the opposition that the share should be worth $17 to $21, you could buy them for 11 You probably weren't going to get a better deal than doing buybacks. So it made a ton of sense to do a buyback to maximize shareholder value. But now, actually, because there's so much concern about the financial health of the business, you don't want that runaway snowball, right? You'll end up in a very similar position to like some of the banks where everyone just loses confidence and, you know, you can't get your credit insured. No banks will lend to you, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it has a it makes a ton of sense uh, to actually have this as buying backs won't help the leverage position and will likely undermine. Uh, confidence in the business further, which is really shaky at the moment, to be honest with you, even like relatively optimistic investors and even assuming that you're giving MPW the benefit of the doubt and what they're saying. Um, you know, this is clearly a business that has some challenges, which is a shame because in a lot of ways, this was expected to be the year when healthcare started to recover from the pandemic lockdowns, right? When all of the deferred surgeries and treatments started to be happening again and businesses and hospitals uh, started to see their financial situation improve. And in fairness, for most of um, MPW's customers, that's exactly what happened. Again, when you look at the supplementary information that's provided, you see improving uh, coverage rates, improving financial uh, situations in hospitals, so you know, income is improving and cost um, rises are starting to level out. Um, 
So it, it's broadly speaking moving in the right direction, but the fact is that Prospect and Steward together account for it's, uh, almost a third of MPW's business. So, you know, it, it's not um, insignificant. And especially if both of them were not able to pay their rent, that is when I think the, um, the dividend would be under stress, basically. Like if you look at the payout ratio and the amount of excess built in, there probably is about a 30% um, headroom, which seems like it should be plenty. Um, but obviously that that would be the concern basically so as long as MPW keep paying out dividend you know you're looking at a 120 dividend a year and then you're getting a PE of five as well you know it looks like very good value but you have to sort of um, be willing to accept that there's nothing dubious going on here that the situation at least won't get any worse and that they'll at least be able to maintain dividend so there is some risk for sure with MPW I would still take the argument that it's so dirt cheap and so much negativity has already been factored in that short of Stewart legitimately hitting the wall and sort of short of Prospect legitimately hitting the wall, they'd be fine. And even then, MPW have got first dibs on all of the, you know, basically the, the loans convert to equity. They take back ownership of the hospital and they should be able to find other uh, companies to take over. So um, we will see though, but that, there's a, there are a lot of unknowns with this business. So if you're a risk adverse investor or you just have no confidence in the business for whatever reason, then it's clearly not going to be for you. Um, just to round it off, what MBW said, which is always one of these like, uh, you know, things that could, depends how you want to interpret it. But from their perspective, they said no options off the table, which I, I believe in the way that it was sort of um, off the back of another sentence meant that they would be quite flexible in terms of commercial loans or taking equity positions or doing refinancing or whatever else was needed. Also relating to buybacks as well. But for now, they basically felt like they'd given enough prudence to the prospect situation in the earnings forecast and that they had enough funds available to, to weather uh, the storm and including the refinancing of debt that they would have to be doing over the next sort of seven years. But there, there's a couple that fall due in 24 and 25 uh, that are something like a fifth of their overall borrowing. So it does start to become a material amount of money. Uh, but we will see. My position, though, like I say, is even though I'm very down on MBW at the moment, down about 45% on my position, uh, I remain pretty fine with the business. I, If I was still able to buy individual shares, I would be buying into MBW. To me, it just looks like screaming value at the moment, but it is going to be a bit of a bumpy ride for at least the next couple of years. And it is all going to depend what happens with Viceroy, with Steward, with Prospect, with MBW themselves. And so I can understand why people don't take that position. But that's my opinion. I have reduced my target share price because of all this stuff. So originally I was sort of at like $21. Now I'm more in like the 15 to 17 kind of range. But again, to me, there's still enough upside there to justify the risk. So just my personal opinion, of course. Uh, but that was my uh, takeaway from the earnings call, which was honestly better than I was expecting. All right, so next we're going to do my largest position, which is Gamma. This is a telco company, about 1.1 billion market cap. Um, it had an interesting reaction to the results. First of all, very negative and then recovered. But I still believe that Gamma is materially undervalued. First of all, I'm going to start with the EPS, and I've put a summary of the earnings there taken from their full year results for last calendar year. Uh, but EPS was down 8%, which is the initial reaction, basically, which is quite poor. However, the adjusted EPS was up 12%. And effectively, the delta between those two numbers constitutes a difficult situation in Spain, I would say, where their first acquisition in Spain received a very large write down. Uh, of about 12 million, which for a company of this kind of size is very material. But actually, a lot of the operational metrics were really positive with, I would say, one or two exceptions, which we'll get to in a second. Overall, their net adjusted EPS was in line with expectations of 72p, um, share currently about £11.50. So you can kind of do the math on that relatively quickly. Um, so it, it doesn't look like it's an especially a uh, bargain at the moment, but I, I think Gamma is like the finest telecoms company that I'm personally aware of. And I know that my peers in the industry feel very similarly as well. Um, it's a very interesting business. And I, I did see a comment on one of my previous videos um, asking me to talk about them a little bit more. So I've got a couple of pictures here as well, which we'll get to in just a second. I would also highlight though, before we do that, that the cash and cash equivalents is now equivalent to 9% of their market cap, which is really significant. They are a very cash generative business. 
and they're really good at converting their revenue into cash. This is this might sound like obvious, but actually in telecom specifically, this is quite difficult because, you know, you lead with like your headline revenue figure and then you have product discounts, right? Introductory free periods, those kind of things. And then you end up doing a lot in terms of goodwill credits and things like that, right? My network went down, the sale wasn't clear, just something. There's a lot of credits that get given as well. And then on top of that, you have difficulty actually collecting payments, right? What's your DDs like? What's your um, debt like? Um, you know, what's your recovery like from that dunning as it's uh, uh, properly called? And so what you often see is kind of a very big delta between like headline revenue figures and actually cash in the bank. Um, Gamma are the first company that I'm aware of that have a 90% conversion between that uh, waterfall, as I would term it. I'm much more used to seeing figures around sort of low 70% just to put that into into context and, and i mean again anything i sort of over 80 is considered perfectly viable uh, anything under 70 you start kind of destroying any hope you have of becoming profitable and you know i've seen whole businesses and, and whole divisions of businesses get sold because even though you know they had millions of customers in one case um they just couldn't achieve that kind of profitable cash in the bank which is what really matters from a telco perspective um in terms of performance, the, the main highlight I would say was Germany, which was up 8%, which probably doesn't sound like much, but I mean, Vodafone in particular is in the news at the moment because it's having a dreadful time in Germany. And Germany's introduced a lot of unfavorable regulations recently for telco um, contracts and how you manage bad payers and those kind of things. And also within Germany, well, within Europe more generally, they also have a mobile division called Epsilon. And likewise as well, that performed extremely well. So it's not just sort of, um, you know, actually, again, mobile margins aren't what they used to be in telecoms. So the fact that they are performing in Germany and in mobile so well for me is really positive. Uh, and yeah, I would say that Germany, that this, this is a little bit controversial, but I think most people would agree that Germany is Europe's toughest market. It's incredibly competitive, very low margin and fairly um, unfavorable in terms of the regulator and the, the provisions that you have to do in order to navigate that make it quite difficult as well. There's also not as much opportunity for using data to improve margins because Germany is very strict on what kind of data you can use and how you can use it for. So some of the cleverer stuff that you can do in other European countries, you just can't do in Germany. So again, you, you end up with less opportunities to improve uh, ARPU and things like that. So it's definitely a challenging market. Um, UK markets were both up and by markets, I mean both direct and indirect. So basically Gamma sell both directly to customers and indirectly, which means to other telecoms companies. That might sound unusual for anyone not in the industry, but actually it's super common. BT do very similar. They have BT retail and BT wholesale before we even get into open reach and everything else. Um, and really this is just because of the size of the customer that they're working with. Like Gamma don't really wanna be dealing with, you know, five man estate agents or recruitment companies, but of course they'll be very happy to deal with very large estate agents and very large, um, you know, um, estate agents and recruitment companies. And what they'll then do instead is they'll sell to another telecoms company who are dealing with the smaller businesses. So even though it looks like kind of Gamma would be competing against themselves and, you know, why would you buy from Gamma when you're potentially going to be competing with them? Actually, they operate as two different markets because of the size of the customer base that you're dealing with, which is quite important uh, in terms of what the telecoms demands are from those customers. So. Uh, I would say 10% growth in both is really good. Gamma also added uh, their SIP seats as well, where they remain the UK's largest provider of IP telephony. A lot of people don't realize this, but where BT sort of sweated their copper assets for such a long time, they basically were a Mickey Mouse organization for a while, about 10 years ago, 15, 12 years ago. I went to visit both BT's IP, they, they called it a SIP VoIP conveyance, they were calling it, which is a mouthful in itself. And it was like a free man, in a shed job in Wolves, so which is like, you know, an industrial town in uh, Northish England. And then I went to see Gamma and it was just like a different beast altogether. It was, it was a very clear uh, distinction between the two of them. <clears throat> that person who asked me to speak about Gamma also wanted me to talk about things like competitors. And I would say that because Gamma is quite diverse in what it does, it sort of depends on the where the customer is in their journey. <clears throat> so here, I just want to sort of point to people's attention in the bottom arrow there and this has kind of evolved uh, over the last couple of years in terms of what gamma's presenting but broadly speaking in telecoms you have sort of legacy telecoms which is you know copper in the ground PSTN lines 
and digital PBX systems, so phone systems, but very basic phone systems compared to what you have today. And they're, they're called ISDNs. Um, but the, these are like legacy products. And from that perspective, you're competing against the big boys, right? Like the biggest one in the UK is OpenReach. They still own the majority of the, the PSDN network. And then you end up competing against BT Wholesale on the ISDN side. So you're basically competing against big boys. Vodafone are in that as well, O2. Everyone basically, the your incumbent players are very active. You've also got companies as well like um, Virgin and where Vodafone were buying networks in the past. And I'm, I'm quite critical of Vodafone's acquisitions. <laughs> One of the companies they bought was Cable & Wireless, which gave them a, a very large uh, physical presence in the UK, as well as sort of a good international uh, portfolio for the legacy uh, phone usage. Um, so Vodafone are actually very large as well in terms of um, network in the UK. And then what you do is you go from digital ISDNs to SIP, and this tends to be a bit of a win for both the customer and the telco, but it's kind of hidden because what happens is with, with ISDNs and PSTNs, your revenue is quite good. You're looking at sort of 12 to 15 pounds per connection, um, but your margins are quite small because you only make sort of one to three pounds uh, within that profit. What happens when you go to SIP is you basically end up with a very efficient business. So you're selling each SIP trunk typically to the customer for about five pounds. If you're Gamma, that's what they have as their list price. Um, but you're buying it dirt cheap. It's almost like um, close to zero basically um, because it's your own SIP trunk. And also because a, um, a company will never need 100% of their maximum usage, even though you might be selling say a million SIP trunks, you only need to have the network in place, the architecture in place to support 600,000. So you end up like moving your margin from sort of maybe being 20 to 30% to more like 70 to 90%, depending on exactly how you do it. Even though your revenue will decrease very significantly, your profit increases substantially. Uh, so it's a bit of a win-win. And then what Gamma do as well is, as well as charging for SIP trunks, they charge another pound 25 for DDIs, so direct dials. And this is kind of just imaginary in a way, <laughs> yeah, but it's basically to give people a phone number, uh, which is made up. It's uh, like a, you know, a, a cloud number really that doesn't really exist. Um, but it, it, it sort of is a legacy ha uh, handover from previous, and it's just a very profitable business. So we're here we have like the, the cloud PBX, which is the phone system within that we have SIP. Um, and then you have sort of Horizon Collaborate. These are like call center solutions. So, you know, when you call a, a helpline customer services center, you, you have very sophisticated abilities to manage that usage. Um, and those calls and the traffic and everything else. So again, you, you end up basically being able to sell lots of stuff on top. And then eventually you end up with this full Horizon contact center. And Horizon is something that Gamma has been building for years. It's basically their own solution almost from the ground up. It does basically everything, different components of it. But I mean, I last worked with Gamma about eight years ago and I started working with Gamma about 15 years ago on a project around mobile, actually, interestingly. And even then they were in the early stages of developing Horizon. So this is like a long-term strategy for them to basically build their own BSS, so business systems and OSS, so network effectively, uh, and, and then sort of get customers from the legacy phone systems into SIP and newer phone systems, and then basically sell them as much stuff as they can on top of that. Once you have that situation, you just end up with a very sticky customer that is very unlikely to leave and kind of needs to pay you. Otherwise, their entire business is at risk of falling over because it just becomes too critical as their infrastructure, basically. So this is sort of the, the journey. As you go further through the journey, you start ending up with different competitors. <clears throat> so, you know, when, when I look at like the PBX, for example, you end up the legacy providers here would be people like Mitel and Avaya and Cisco. Newer providers, probably the best one would maybe be 8x8. Uh, this is a, uh, a US uh, PBX phone company. Again, uh, cl primarily cloud um, PBX um, are there. And then you've also got challenges from the likes of mobile. So again, um, Gamma basically resell, right? They're still an, an MVNO, so they still don't have their own mobile network, but they'll buy it from Vodafone, from 3, from O2. And then you'll be dealing with Gamma directly, um, as most customers will, because you, most businesses aren't big enough to justify dealing with MNOs directly. So they'll go to Gamma uh, instead, who may or may not sell it to another telco, right? So that whole journey looks very interesting as well. Um, and yeah, so, so depending on exactly what service you're doing will depend on the kind of competitors that you have. But in my opinion, because Gamma sort of 
their business model is really to take customers through that journey, you end up with a lot of ability to upsell uh, and to sell more than what customers currently have. And you know, Gamma's, this is basically Gamma's idea in Europe, which is that mainland Europe is a few years behind the UK, and therefore there, there is this opportunity to take the continental Europe on a very similar journey to UK. And by the way, the UK itself is probably a few years behind Scandinavia, which is often seen as sort of uh, leading in, in some of these areas. So um, Gamma's position here is that they still believe that there is a great opportunity in the UK. Um, but yeah, Europe was essentially flat. But what they want to be doing with Europe is taking them on this journey. And I thought it was really interesting in these numbers that the Netherlands especially saw an 8% reduction. So whereas Germany was really positive, the Netherlands was very negative. And even though the Netherlands is also a very mature telco market, which is fairly competitive for sure, it's definitely one of the more competitive markets. I was disappointed really because I felt like Gamma glossed over the reasons for it, which was a, a, a significant reduction in core revenue. And again, this is the direction that telcos and the telecom market is going, where usage revenue just isn't where you make your money anymore. You want to get people off of usage and onto recurring charges, right? This is where Gamma has been really strong. But it was difficult for me to understand how core revenue decreased so much without an increased um, response in you know moving customers over to recurring revenue or what that really looked like again this it is to be expected as part of this journey that, that revenue decreases and you know again your um, your overall revenue would decrease but there was no kind of corresponding silver lining to this drop it was just a big usage apparently it was linked to usage which to me is really surprising because you know you shouldn't be making eight percent of your overall revenue from usage anymore um in most cases so i, I want to see them like respond in the netherlands suitably and go from there but that was definitely disappointing um spain flat um again though was responsible for the eps differences that i've already flagged uh, there was some good news on the cloud PBX seats. So basically, you know, the start of this journey, basically, so up 14% overall. And again, UK up 11 and Europe plus 28. So really solid uh, growth. They they basically were saying that Europe is uh, expected to grow at this kind of speed for the next sort of five years as it kind of plays catch up. And their long term plan is to have a single pan-European business model. So, you know, they'd, they'd probably still have their business units where, you know, you have direct, indirect, <clears throat> and within indirect, you'd have different size customers as well. Um, but what they want to have is like a single architecture ultimately. So, you know, that's probably going to be a single billing system, a single CRM system, a single contact center system, single product catalog, you know, with differences for sort of um, currencies and things like that. But broadly speaking, a very uh, scalable business, which is what I believe Gamma has built and why I'm so optimistic on how they're going to be heading into the future. Sip trunks as well, we've already touched on, but uh, up 24 percent and interestingly up 23 percent on non gamma owned PBXs. So again, typically what you do is you take over the PSTN or the ISTN first to give you access to the, the line rentals. Sometimes I've heard it called network services, but it's basically phone lines and phone usage so calls potentially, as well as data and text, etc. And then you start taking over the phone system itself. Uh, so this, this was really good to see this kind of growth on non gamma owned PBXs. It sort of uh, vindicates and shows that uh, that journey should be working as expected. <clears throat> and the cash conversion, who we've already spoken of as well. So what I just want to do is finish off with the middle table here, which is Gamma's newish uh, top five. They have had instances of this before, but this is the first time they put it on a single slide. So yeah, basically the UK remains the primary driver of Gamma. It's still kind of an 80% UK focused business. And the fact is that the UK is growing faster currently than um, than Europe. So actually, if anything, it's not going to change anytime soon. And to be honest, for the next couple of years, because Europe is only starting this journey where the, you know, we're going from legacy telco to SIP to PBX, etc. Uh, I, I am expecting European revenue to decrease um, on a like for like basis with the 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 asterisks there being how quickly it can grow, because, again, there are opportunities in all of the markets including the UK as the legacy networks are being retired so every country in Europe is going to be ditching their their copper lines by the end of this decade um, and you know what what should happen also is the customers will be forced to change and you might as well just go from PSTN straight to SIP where Gamma is especially strong and you'll also see a lot of legacy telco providers that have relied on legacy um, 
line rental and usage will basically run out of the business model. So there might be opportunities for Gamma to pick up distressed businesses as well as to pick up new customers. And to me, this is the only reason why it makes so much sense to keep so much money on the books at the moment. Otherwise, I'd be wanting to see like bigger dividends or a buyback. Potentially, I could definitely justify a buyback for Gamma in the next couple of years. But right now, because they've increased their dividend 14% this year, which is in line with the long term plans of 11 to 15% year on year, um, you know, they basically got a war chest as I would recognize it. And Gamma's long term dividend policy is to increase dividend by that. Um, but where their EPS has traditionally been growing faster than that, they've actually ended up with a fairly low payout ratio now. So this year would see a slight increase in their payout ratio, but still pretty modest, like less than 20%. And I think I'm broadly happy with that kind of payout ratio for this business. Like it's mature in a way, it's been around for several decades, but it, it's still at a relatively new stage as it looks to scale and, and so on. The thing is though, is I think unless you have confidence as I do in the business, you look at this and you sort of see a 15 PE uh, and you sort of like, okay, well, even if they grow at like 12% next year, you're still looking at like a forward PE of maybe like 13. Uh, it doesn't exactly look cheap. But again, I just, I see a ton of opportunities for Gamma. I think it's really undervalued. I think it's one of those where if you've got a long-term time horizon and you want your very textbook dividend growth company, this is them. Uh, so even though at the moment I have like a 14 pound average and I'm very red, I'm very red, I'm down like 25% on Gamma. Um, I'm really confident in my largest holding. They're my largest holding for a reason. I feel like I know the industry and the company pretty well. I also, uh, for disclosure, I know a couple of people in their senior management team, um, more professionally than, you know, closely, but just to put that out there as well. I don't have any inside information or anything like that, uh, but I do declare it just because I think it's important considering I also work in this industry. So yeah. Just to, to round off then, so European market underpenetrated, this is kind of what, going back to what I've already mentioned. What they're also seeing as well um, is that where customers are adding bolt-ons, so these kind of you know additional functionalities here, like the integration with MS Teams has been a complete money winner for, uh, for Gamma and actually quite a lot of the telecoms market as well. Um, that's been good, which is why the ARPU is growing as well. And you know, you're also again seeing this, I mean, they call it evolution of SIP, um, but really, it's kind of this customer journey. Um, there is, I guess, some integration with sort of IT solutions now hosting those kind of things as well, which will likewise, um, which has over time created a much closer union between telecoms and IT. This first started to happen with IP usage, right, uh, which is Internet Protocol, literally. And then SIP became like the standard way of communicating with IP telephony. So this is, uh, you can also do some really clever stuff. Like I'm not gonna nerd it up on this call because I don't think it's quite the right place, but you could do some really clever things with um, IP usage that you can't do with traditional usage and line rentals. Uh, and again, I've worked with Gamma uh, at, a, at another company when I was employed, but we were using Gamma for our provider. And again, they have some nifty solutions. So I'm very comfortable that they're gonna do that. But yeah, you, you basically like, to me, this is a buy, but it's it, you can look at this and say, actually, it doesn't exactly look cheap and it's still a very young company. So, but that, that's my takeaway anyway. So like I say, do your own research. I think Gamma is a very approachable investor relations page and they've got like interviews with all of their senior management and those kind of things as well. So do your own research, but that's my position with Gamma as it stands. And I thought, although the numbers weren't great because of the write down, actually the adjusted EPS still looks absolutely fine and the future direction likewise, absolutely fine. All right, so broadly, I would say that things continue to go very well for Genie. Uh, they've now made guidance for six quarters running. As I've spoken about before, I went on to a investor day on January 2022 and was really convinced by what I saw. It's important that you remember as well that although Genius's growth potential is all US focused at the moment, that they already have a profitable European business and they're effectively able to use that to, to some degree, subsidize US expansion, which is now starting to really pick up. Um, this is the first occasion of the last six quarters where they actually did increase guidance. I would say after the earnings last quarter, there was a huge drop in the share price where if I was buying individual shares, I would have bought a lot because I just couldn't understand why the share price went down. It was basically a disappointment that guidance wasn't improved. This time they did improve guidance. I still believe that the share price is probably about 20% where it needs to be 
uh, in order to catch up with events. But I'm actually still like 40% down on my position at the moment. So again, I, I accept I overpaid for this in the kind of SPAC boom of the past. But I don't want you to think that just because this is a SPAC, that it isn't a legitimate business, because actually I think it's impressive more and more as we go on. And I think they basically place themselves at the center of an entire ecosystem, which is going to expand really well. And, you know, now that they've started to add new states as well, they're basically able to add states and almost immediately make them profitable because they've already built all of the infrastructure and the technology. And now it's almost like, you know, you're just basically evolving and, and kind of go, they're starting to become a mature business, basically. And I think the big test will be next year when we start to add, uh, when we start to do re-signs of key contracts like the NFL, the NBA, et cetera, that, that's going to be key to make sure that, you know, we can have that as an ongoing business. But broadly speaking, I really like what I'm seeing. Uh, EBITDA is now profitable, running comfortably ahead of expectations. And you can see actually a very significant increase in both the, the EBITDA margin and also the EBITDA itself. So again, I'm always a bit skeptical about over-focusing on EBITDA because it's basically a, a kind of profit measure, which isn't really a profit measure, right? It, it, the main important stuff is on the net profit. But for businesses which are small, high growth and or potentially need a very significant investment. Um, I think a bit that can make sense. I, I work for a fiber company where it's a fairly similar model, like once the pipes in the ground or the glass, technically, once the fiber is in the ground, um, actually the, the gross margins are absolutely ginormous on fiber, you know, 90% would be fairly standard. Um, but actually digging up a road and laying it down is, is incredibly expensive. And typically you end up requiring PE, private equity or an investment bank, or you need to be huge in scale in order to build those kind of networks. Um, so I think a bit that can make sense from that perspective and a genius to some degree have fairly similar where they, you know, they're basically having to buy this stuff, develop this stuff and so on. And so I think a bit there is OK, but I'd like to see them move away from a bit and into net profit from 2024. But to be clear, their focus and their targets and the fact they've been meeting these targets has been on a bit last year. You know, again, they they kind of uh, proved that and became profitable, I think, in Q4 last year. And then since then, we're starting to see it ramp up now. So that's really good. It is they don't disclose geographic differences outside of the investor day last year, but they do, um, you know, basically they regularly get asked questions by analysts. so They regularly answer. And, you know, basically they said that the US um, isn't uh, a bit profitable by itself. In fairness to Genius, part of the reason why it's difficult for them to answer is because a lot of the technology is kind of centralized, right? Once you build it, like where is the geographic cost of that you end up with kind of I guess it's like overhead absorption uh, so you end up sort of having to deploy it somewhere in terms of where your cost sits but it's it's a fairly centralized sort of uh, stack um, so I, I kind of get where they're coming from and to be honest with you I'm kind of fine as long as they continue to deliver uh, that's to me is the most important thing so a bit there is now expected to be profitable for the future and from next year the US uh, would also become a bit to profitable is the expectation they reaffirmed net profit for the group in 2024, and it's probably reasonable to expect net profit for the US sort of a year afterwards as well. For Q1, the net profit is still pretty negative at minus 25 million, but again, very uh, cash fine. And, um, you know, I, I don't expect this to be a problem. Uh, I'm not expecting any additional requirements for capital or anything like that. And indeed, Genius are, are guiding on the same thing. So that's fine. Um, it is worth pointing out these major re-signs in 2024. Um, a couple of analysts asked about it, but you know, Genius were pretty, uh, very confident. I've, if you sanguine here, I think that's a fine word to use. They seemed incredibly relaxed about it. Like this is a business, I think, and a management team, which has become very confident in themselves and their business and their product. And they just believe that everything that they're seeing in terms of, you know, actually selling additional services to existing customers um, is going to mean that they're just too important to ditch. They, they've, like I say, built themselves this uh, product or products really across, uh, you know, three different channels and that they are delivering value and that there's no reason for these uh, sports books and um, media providers to leave them because they're benefiting from the product and their relationship with Genius. Uh, Dragon here is their new sort of uh, second spectrum. Um, I've spoken about this before, having went, gone on to a product demonstration of Dragon. 
I said at the time, I believe it's more evolution than revolution. I stand by that comment, even though Genius themselves seem to really rave about it. It is cool, by the way. I don't want to sound like it's, you know, if you're a techie or a general just nerd like me, uh, I think, you know, you can go on and look at Dragon and see it's got, it's really impressive. Uh, and probably in the future, we're just going to be playing also like holographic teams. You can eventually imagine it getting there. Like Dragon slash Genius are collecting so many data points that they'll be able to like create secondary and tertiary markets that don't even exist today. So one of the cool things, you know, is you can basically change who's sponsoring certain billboards. Tencent, by the way, have a very similar products as well. I think it's really amazing. So you end up with like constantly being able to uh, resell a, a product that you've already sold, which is, you know, like if somebody is rewatching a broadcast of an event, you can update the marketing billboards and etc. that you're selling to marketeers at that moment in time, which means the content just always stays relevant. Uh, so I think that's super cool. Uh, and likewise as well, basically, because they are able to record so many data points now and sort of track where the ball is in various sports. They can basically tell if uh, you know, a basket's going to be made or a goal is going to be scored before it actually happens in real time. Because, you know, basically, you know, th there's enough data points now to sort of track the, the direction of the ball and the, the motion of the player and everything else. So it's pretty crazy. You're, you're sort of looking at like wireframe taken to the extreme. But ultimately, from a, a broadcasting perspective and certainly from a sports books perspective, I don't think it adds a ton of immediate value maybe i'm missing something but again other than being cool and potentially opening up a few additional uh, betting markets in particular um that's where i think it's going to be interesting to see and something the genius have highlighted is their arpu and their cost of customer acquisition are both better than uh basically than they were expecting um because they're sort of working with uh bookies to improve the way that odds are offered uh, into more profitable ways. So again, I think this is all very exciting and, and cool. Um, and as a result of all of this, I think a combination of this and again, the fact that they have contested and successfully delivered, uh, successfully defended their their rights and their whole business model in several court cases over the last 12 months just mean that you end up, you've got a business now that I think is reaching scale. And that as long as it becomes profitable should eventually mean a, a very profitable position in my portfolio, even though it's still very red at the moment. Uh, my one uh, additional sadness was that in the past they were showing, you know, a before and after, like this is what our performance would be like if FX wasn't doing this and here is what it is afterwards, right? <clears throat> and they're no longer doing that. They basically said that it, at the moment there isn't a material difference, like they, they've set guidance for the year of £1 to $1.20. Uh, it's about one twenty six at the moment, I believe, last I looked. Um, but they sort of said that so far it's more or less in line with that, their expectations. Uh, but, you know, it basically if it does deviate substantially, then they would look to reinstate it. But for me, I, I kind of wanted to see how much of their revenue and how much of their forward guidance has been improved because actually now they're benefiting from currency movements rather than adverse, which is what was happening previously. So I'm a little bit skeptical about that. I don't think with the 126 currently, it should be too material, but I also want to keep them honest and make sure that we're not seeing these improvements only because we've now got that favorable FX, right? So I think it'll be, I'll, I'll keep an eye on it. Uh, but yeah, for me, that was always interesting to see in the past, but I was very happy with Genius. Um, although I accept I overpaid, you know, I've got an $8 average. Uh, so so even if you accept my argument that this is worth six against the current like 470 odd that it's trading at, um, you know, it's clear that I've overpaid in the past, as I've mentioned, and, and that's OK to admit mistakes. Uh, but for me, I think you don't want to compound mistakes. Right. And if I was to sell, I, I was very prepared to sell in January last year at like a 70 percent loss. Um, I've done like big write downs on SPAC positions before where I made mistakes in the past. Um, but here I'm really confident long term. So even though I've gone from minus 70 to minus 40, um, we, yeah, I was very happy with what I'm seeing, basically. Again, this is a business which is starting to reach maturity, where I've always been impressed with the management team, actually, and the kind of strategy and direction of travel. And it's really great that they're now starting to improve their guidance for the future and hopefully will become profitable next year. Uh, so, yeah, all awesome. Uh, I haven't got anything else to add. Very long video, but then I haven't been with you for over a month. So uh, hopefully that's good. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Questions, etc. below. I've been the Boss Hog and good luck with your investing. Bye for now, everyone.